So uh, Thor is saying that see, he is. Uh, what can you see now? Um, I see um, the galaxy and the green sands. Oh, and now I see my presentation. Okay, so, great. So now it's working well. Okay. So um, everyone out there is uh, agreeing with that. <laughs> so. Okay, try to change to the next slide. It's okay. Do you see? Yeah. So, so you see the next slides, but um, okay, wait. Okay, fine. Go back to the first one and uh, let's uh, get rolling here. <clears throat> All right. So, what's next, uh, Melanie? Okay. okay. So now it's. I have no clue what time is it actually. I think it's 12 or around, so we can start. So yeah, can. every hello everyone and welcome to today's <laughs> webinars entitled Deep Crustal Diversity of Mafic and Ultramafic Large Igneous Provinces Forming Mantle Melt with Implication for Large Scale Magmatism and Ore Forming Processes. My name is Melanie Foyer and I will be your moderator and host for this session today. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker Rune Larsen. Rune is professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology at Trondheim in Norway. Today he's going to talk about uh, his favorite topics, the Ceylon Igneous Provinces. But uh, before I hand the mic over to Rune, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about this presentation and the webinar platform. So as you saw, uh, today's webinar will be recorded, so I will uh, send you the link uh, after to get the video offline and you can watch it on YouTube channel. And um, also the next is uh, that we love to hear you uh, and g ask questions. So you can do it as uh, everybody can see on the chat tab on the bottom of your player. So we will answer in question at the end of the session. And if you don't get uh, to your answer today, uh, we will sure to follow up afterwards. So yeah, that's it. And uh, I would like to kick things off and welcoming Rune Larsen. So Rune, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Melanie. Um, if anyone has problems uh, hearing me talking, uh, please let me know. And uh, I can see what I can uh, do about it, or rather what uh, Melanie can do about it. First of all, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to uh, discuss my uh, Currently, my favorite topic, well, one of my two ones, the other one is quartz, so that is something completely different. Um, and um, also for sharing it with uh, people interested just about anywhere in the world, to use the, the big words. I mean, I'm, I'm happy if more than, uh, more than 10 people are actually listening to me. Anyway, uh, so we have it here. Uh, you have uh, the most uh, important uh, faculty members, uh, Bjorn, Thomas, Suzanne, and uh, Christian from Aarhus. But uh, then it should also be added that we have um, a small army of uh, graduate and uh, postgraduate scholars who has been active in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in studying the, the, the silent Ignis province uh, throughout the, the past five years since we began in 2011. So um, let's just get uh, right into it. What is this all about? Uh, if you go to the next slide, Melanie. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, there it is. Whew, it worked. OK, so I mean, large Ignis pro provinces and uh, the formation of um, large uh, magmatic plumbing systems. I mean, what does it all have to do with, uh, with Silent? Um, in a way, I mean, all of this is, uh, is, is summarized in this somewhat uh, naive figure. It is from, um, it is from uh, uh, Van Gedelt in the chemical geology and uh, actually addresses the uh, Emishan uh, large igneous province. Um, <clears throat> what is uh, summarized here is sort of like the transition from um, a mantle plume to, uh, I mean, in the, in the uh, asthenosphere to um, to, uh, to flood basalt volcanism on the formation of a large igneous province on the surface. Um, we, have a, we have several large igneous provinces um, around the world today. And, um, and uh, they, have, of course, have been extensively studied and we have like thousands of articles. One of the big problems with these uh, known or well-known large igneous provinces is that we only have the upper part um, exposed of it. 
And um, I don't know, you can probably not see my pointer. Can I use a pointer here, Melanie? Melanie, can I use the pointer? Probably not. Okay, it does matter. Anyway, I can't. Um, no, it's fine. I mean, you, you, I, I, I will have to be good at describing what I'm actually talking about. Anyway, we have this, uh, this, uh, this figure showing a cross section through the um, asthenosphere in the bottom, the lithospheric mantle, and uh, the crust above. Then the crust may be subdivided into the brittle upper part and the ductile lower part. Uh, today, I mean, most of the large sequence promises, they are only exposing either the surface with a flock basal uh, volcanism, or they are, they are um, exposing, say, the upper brittle part of the crust, or say, the brittle part, the part of the crust. And we have plenty of layer gap rows that are either subvolcanic, or maybe may be exposed down to a depth of, say, 12, 15 kilometers. So, I mean, our problem is that we don't really know what happened to the parental melts forming the flock basalts and forming the layer gap rows in the uppermost part of the crust. We can guess, of course, but we have very few areas where we can go and observe in details what is actually going on when, uh, when hot mafic also mafic melts are transferred from the um, asthenosphere to the lithosphere. So this is actually where SIP comes into the picture. One of our um, uh, working hypotheses is that uh, SIP represents um, a deep-seated or the deep-seated part of these large conduit systems that it actually formed above, above a mantle plume and that um, uh, uh, the igneous processes in SIP uh, modified um, the magmas from the asthenosphere before convey, con conveying them to more shallow crustal levels. So that is really the rationale for going to the silent igneous province to start this in detail. You could also go to the Emishan, and we may have a few other localities throughout the world, but I mean, certainly we hold that uh, if you really want brilliant exposures and um, and pristine rocks, then a SIP may actually be the best uh, uh, part of the world to observe these, um, these uh, deep crustal processes. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's just start out with uh, the regional geological setting of SIP. Um, everything in gray represents uh, layered gap rows. Um, in yellow, we have uh, the country rock metal sediments. They are actually um, uh, all classified pretty much as uh, the Klubben Samites. Um, then we have uh, in the green, we have the ultramafic complexes. The ultramafic complexes will be the, the, main, uh, the main player, so to speak, throughout this talk, because I mean, we will say that if you want to know anything about the transfer of mafic ultramafic melts from the deep mantle, then this is the place to go. In our theory, these ultramafic complexes uh, numbered uh, from um, well three, three, four, five, and nine, they are they are actually the de facto conduit systems uh, transferring the metals from deeper down. And then additionally, in red and in blue colors, we have um, alkaline complexes dominated by carbonatites and cyanides. We have uh, three uh, larger occurrences and then a number of smaller ones. And uh, finally, we have in um, in dark green. We have hornblendites that represent some of the last uh, igneous events um, assembling the silent igneous province. So I will focus on number three, which is the North of Boomer's Fjord, number four, which is called Melkvan, number five, which is Melkfjord, and finally number nine, that is the Rheinfjord. Next slide. So just so I'm not totally lost in the uh, my own uh, babbling here, I will go through some of the highlights, so to speak, of uh, the Silent Ignis province. I mean, one thing we know for sure is that it is, um, that it formed in the um, Ediacaran, in the latest period of the uh, Precambrian, that the magmatism actually spilled into the Cambrian, but that we have the main activity between 580 and 560. Uh, this also means that um, Silent is part of the central Iapetus magmatic province, he after called Kimp, or maybe Simp. Um, then uh, we can also see that it is a giant magmatic conduit system that formed at a depth of 25 to 35 kilometers. Um, and uh, the main conduits, they, are, they comprises four large ultramafic complexes. 
Uh, we also uh, our, our also demonstrates that zip um, formed or the ultramafic rocks formed from um, well actually also the mafic rocks they all formed from a uh, picritic melts very primitive picritic melts having 16 to 22 weight percent uh, MGO. Uh, then also another important conclusion in the end is that uh, that the conduit systems they comprises a rich diversity of melts. And uh, what's interesting is that this diversity of melts, including alkaline, basaltic, and picritic compositions, they actually enter the conduit systems simultaneously. In other words, we have several different sources working at the same time. But we do also have an over overall uh, evolution going from alkaline or basaltic to picritic and uh, then uh, back again. Finally, the melts are very fertile and facilitated the PGE carbon nickel reefs that are anomalous, anomalously uh, high in osmium and rhodium. Next slide, please. Some more highlights. We have uh, 20,000 cubic kilometers of juvenile magmas. Then we have some boring statistics there. Then uh, I would like to jump down to the uh, radiogenic isotopes. You can see that um, epsilon hafnium, this is the fourth bullet point, Epsilon hafnium goes from plus 8 to minus 6, neodymium from plus 4 to minus 4. So if you take uh, the highest values, I mean, clearly we are dealing with a very juvenile man derived melts. And this pattern actually continues if you look at uh, the stable isotopes in the next bullet point, where we can see that uh, the sulfur isotopes, they are from minus 2 to plus 2, oxygen 6 to 8, and the carbon from minus 6 to minus 8, which all of it is really like, you know, juvenile mantle values. Another uh, clue here to understand the origin of SIP is that the, it is strongly enriched in the rare earth elements plus other traces and that we have a clear uh, ocean island basalt uh, pattern when we are plotting these uh, compositions in uh, trace element diagrams or in spidergrams as it is called. Uh, we should um, just go to the next slide please. Which is the big picture? I mean, uh, what is really, I mean, I have I've, I've already explained that uh, SIP is part of the um, Central Yapetus Magmatic Province. That means that it is related to um, many of the layered gabbros and the basalts that we find along the, if you will, Scandinavian mountain chain or Norwegian or whatever it's called these days. Um, also the Egerson dikes. Uh, we can also relate it to um, numerous other igneous events. If you go to the slide to the upper right, uh, throughout uh, Greenland and uh, northeastern Canada and the United States, uh, particularly uh, Labrador, but also down into the Appalachians. Um, and finally, on uh, the last slide to the lower right, we have an interpretation from Ernst, I believe it was, probably also several others, as a matter of fact, where he's trying to um, rearrange um, the, um, the, uh, the, the continents back there in the Idacrum. And you can see the Baltic continent to the lower right. Then we have um, uh, parts of Laurentia to, in the upper part of the image. And uh, in this image, uh, the silent Ignis province would be placed to the right, um, where it says something like uh, Sur. Oh, I can't read it. I'm really long sighted. Anyway, it says Sur plus some other names which refers to uh, the, 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 the Stianoia and Suoia alkaline complexes. And as you see here, I mean, it, with this uh, reconstruction, um, um, uh, Siland is actually quite far away from the proposed plume centers that are shown as stars to the left. So the plume centers should be close to Labrador and uh, Southwest Greenland. However, next slide. If we take some uh, newer interpretations, this one from uh, Corfu and the co-workers from uh, 2007, um, and just take a, take a click once, uh, Melanie. Yeah, okay, well, that didn't turn out, turn out so well. But maybe you could see now that a volcano popped up in uh, the southern part of the Yapetus Ocean. And, um, so what really happened here is that, I mean, rather than having SIP forming um, uh, between Baltica and Siberia, um, or in that amalgamation back there, 
uh, Cole actually suggests that uh, that the SIP formed um, in the southern part of the Abatus Ocean, right above these proposed mantle plumes. He, base, he bases this on the several pieces of evidence, uh, including um, the the the, the Klub and Samites that are the host sediments. They actually look much more like the Moin Formation in Scotland and the Cormorfjord Formation in Greenland. And he, we can also see that um, uh, we are lacking some of the Cambrium Ordovician shelf sediments that otherwise are very com common to the Baltic uh, continent at, um, at, um, at this time. And we have a number of other pieces of evidence. So I mean, in my opinion, I mean, I think that Courtney has a really good idea, but let's just say that uh, the jury is still open when it comes to the, to the correct position of, um, of, uh, of, of silence. But of course, I mean, it's quite nice to have it now placed right above uh, the main plume center. Next slide, please. So this is one of the current uh, controversies that I'll come back to during the presentation. Uh, we have two major theories for the origin of uh, the parent melts forming the ultramafic complexes. Uh, one is the one that is presented by Griffin and co-workers, um, actually a very interesting and very provoking paper from uh, 2013. Uh, together with Susanne O'Reilly and several other I mean, the great uh, uh, professors. Uh, what they're suggesting is that the melt held a temperature on 1650 degrees centigrade. It came straight from the core mantle boundary. It had, and now I mean the whole time you had, you know, 40 weight percent NGO. So that is actually genetic compositions and it's totally unheard of. I mean, at least with that age. And furthermore, it was depleted and dry. What they're saying is that all these different ultramafic and mafic rocks in the ultramafic complexes, that is, they formed as a result of variable degrees of GAPRO assimilation. Uh, the model that we um, like better, I would say, is the one that was originally proposed by Bennett, and uh, we revised it a bit in the, our very recent paper from 2018. There we, um, we can see that the MELs agree more with um, the critic melts uh, holding temperatures of 1400 to 1450, say 1500 to be centigrade. Still, this is very primitive, it's very hot. And we can also see that we cannot really produce the rock types that we are observing unless we are having very enriched melts and wet melts. Wet in terms that they have a high content of carbon dioxide and uh, water, I mean, dissolved water and carbon dioxide. And we don't really see extensive evidence for contamination. Next, please. So that brings us to the ultramafic centers. Um, I, we have uh, revised the geological maps for three of them, including Rheinfjord to the right, where we have done most of our work. But we have revised it from uh, unpublished uh, master theses and uh, various other sources. And um, although this may look like a fairly busy slide, I mean, there's actually a lot in common when you compare these three complexes. Particularly when you look at the Kvalfjord and Melkman, we can see that it is divided in three different main rock types. In yellow, close to the contacts, we have the so-called hybrid zone. You can also look at that in the, the profiles underneath. Uh, the hybrid zones that forms as a reaction product between the ultramafic uh, uh, melts and uh, the host rock gap rows. So here, surely, we are back to the Griffin model. But then inside of there, we have olivine clinoperoxenides. And uh, finally, in the core of the complexes, and you see that best if you go to the, to the right map, um, we can see that uh, the core of the complexes are composed of verlites and donites. So we are going towards progressively more primitive rock types when we go from the margin towards the interior of the intrusion. Primitive both in terms of whole rock composition of these cumulates, and remember these accumulates, but also when we talk about the composition of olivine and clinopyroxene. Next. Um, so before going into the chemistry, uh, I would like to go back to the to the Rheinfjord igneous complex. Again, we have these three main rock types. In one, we have, um, well actually in yellow, we have the hybrid rocks formed by reaction between the melts and the garbros or to the upper left, actually the country rock Klubin samite gneisses, these politic gneisses. Then in one, we have uh, the olivine clinoperoxenites. Uh, then in two, we have the verlites, and then we have this huge core of donite. 
to go to the next slides, I will try to I will try to guide you through um, what these various zones looks like in the, in the field. I mean, here all of them being from Ein Fjord. So here you see the 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 gap row to the right, to the upper right, and uh, the uh, the country rock, in other words, and uh, the automatic rocks to the left, the lower left. You can see that uh, you have a very well-defined uh, uh, contact between these two rock types, the automatic rocks intruding the host rock gap rows, and you also see in, um, as you recall it, sort of like more pale colors, um, uh, lensoid um, uh, inclusions of, uh, of uh, the country rock gap row that has dropped down from the roof of the magma chamber. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, this is another image from the contact. Uh, we have uh, the gap rows to the upper right, and we have uh, the automatic rocks to the lower left. And then you may just be able to see that in the contact, the rocks are somewhat darker. And this is like the hybrid zone, the hybrid zone that I will show you a few more slides from in the coming slides. You may also see in this image, and here really miss a pointer, but in this image you have um, um, a long um, 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 apophis, giant apophis of ultramafic melts that is intruding the layered gap rows parallel to the sub-horizontal layering in the host rock gap rows. Um, I don't know if you, Melanie, can point on this, uh, on this finger, this, this dark ultramafic finger. I mean, perhaps you don't see it. Yep, there you are. A little higher, 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 higher. Yeah, and then you go right. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So it uh, it actually continues for like 500, 600 meters into the country rock gap rows. Next slide. Yeah, there we are. So this is what the marginal marginal zone may look like. In other words, this zone of hybridization and contamination between the melts and uh, either the gap rows or the gneisses. Um, in the upper left, we are seeing one of the gabbro pots, and around these gabbro pots, we are quite often seeing a reaction zone where we are seeing the production of a, of a rim or a margin of olivine clinoperoxenides. It will sort of like be the same in the next slide to the right. And then in the last slide in the upper row to the right, we are seeing close to the contact poikilitic plagioclase. Um, in, the, in the hybrid zone, in other words, here we have had wholesale um, assimilation of the gap rows, and then uh, we're actually forming a plateau-place rich automatic rock. Um, this would actually classify as, as, as a Miller gabbro with the composition it has, but we see this in all kinds of uh, varieties. Um, also to the lower left, we are seeing a plateau-place vein, uh, sort of like back injecting into the hybrid zone. We are also seeing mafic veins, uh, we are seeing gabbro pegmatites forming here, and, um, and numerous other uh, contact uh, phenomena. Uh, we are also seeing actually what looks like an ataxis of um, the country of Gabros, where we end up with, um, with, uh, with anatocytic uh, segments, um, patches, as we say, uh, inside the Gabros, and so on and so forth. So plenty of evidence for hybridization, but only in the outermost 100 meters or so. Uh, of uh, the contact, not not when we go inwards towards the other rock types. Uh, next, please. Yeah, there we are. So now we are going into the magma chamber itself. We are leaving this hybridization zone, and we are entering the more pristine rock types. Uh, the most um, common rock types that we see in the verlitic cumulates will be um, macro rhythmic. Uh, layering, like you're seeing in this image, you're seeing this benching in the central part of the, part of the picture, that is uh, macrorhythmic layering, where the lower parts of the layer layers they are diopside rich, and the upper parts are more diopside poor. So we have like I mean typical classical rhythmic layering. Also here we will find the uh, cross bedding, that is what you see in the insert with the hammer, cross bedding with uh, nice uh, faucets and uh, also with uh, unconformities when the new, um, new um, uh, pulses of magma uh, comes into the magma chamber. Next, please. So the verlites, they um, may look something like this. We already see this uh, image with uh, the cross bedding. You also have the image to the lower right where we actually have peroxinitic uh, layers 
uh, comprising parts of the lights. So not necessarily as graded bedding, but more like a modal bedding, uh, modally uh, 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 bedded layering, as it should be called. Um, let's see now, I'm losing the picture here, but it is coming back, good. But here we are seeing, as I said earlier, limited uh, or simply no contamination. In the image uh, to the lower left, we are seeing a typical uh, transmitted light uh, microscopy in the transpolarized polarized light from these uh, from these uh, uh, lights um, being dominated by clinopyroxene, but where surely we are also finding plenty of olivine. Next slide, please. Then um, when we uh, well also in the lights, actually both in the well, most in the lights, we are also seeing other um, if you will magma chamber processes uh, being active. In this image, I mean you may see this. Uh, this wavy pattern in the contact between the yellow and the sort of like darker units of uh, these verlites. The yellowish one uh, actually has uh, dunitic compositions, and then right above we have verlitic, and also below we have verlitic compositions. And right in the contact, we are seeing good evidence for slumping. You can see these waves, and you can maybe also um, see the polarity, I mean, how these waves they are pointing towards the left. And towards the left is actually towards the the main conduit forming the Rheinfjord magmatic uh, complex. So in other words, they're pointing towards uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the conduit of, uh, of, the, of the complex, uh, well, simply because uh, the, uh, the floor is uh, sloping in that direction. Next, please. So this is just a close-up to the upper left of uh, the slumping process. Uh, here you actually see it in the other dimension. So this is a truly a 3D uh, image. We are looking down on the slumping so that uh, these ripples going down towards the, towards the lips, left is uh, so what you saw right before. Um, also uh, implying in this case that, uh, that the slumping direction is uh, towards the right, which is actually in the same direction as the other picture, just taken from sort of like the other direction. So, so in other words, the slumping is towards north, uh, to put it straight. Next image, we have plenty of evidence for um, diaperism. Here we have, oh, one slide back, please. Yeah, diaperism, where diopside-rich verlite is uh, more heavy and slumping into the underlying donites. And then the donite mushes, they are di uh, they, they're diapering, so to speak, uh, into the verlite. Here you can actually also see that, uh, that uh, the clinopyroxene is very magnesium-rich. Well, it's green. Uh, on the average, we have a diopside between 90 and 94 um, um, for, these, uh, for these rocks. Next, please. This brings us to uh, evidence for recharge. As you'll see later, I mean, recharge is really important in the, the silent igneous province. We have multiple evidence. This is one of them, uh, where we can see that a peroxonite, if you go to the upper left image, you can see that a peroxonite dike is coming in from the right, and then it sort of like dissipates into the marshes towards the left. Then in the big image, we have blown up this, um, this, um, this uh, mixing event, and you can see pegmatitic broncitic orthopyroxene that is mixing with the genetic cumulates and actually are more heavy than these cumulates and uh, uh, sort of like drops down to a lower level and accumulate at a deeper level in the cumulus topography. Next. And finally, we see plenty of evidence for replacive donites. I mean, when these dunitic cumulates are forming in the central part of the complex, we can see that the dunitic melts are the donite forming melts. They are infiltrating the verlites, and they are now more primitive than the melts forming the verlites. Therefore, they are replacing, they are absorbing the clinopyroxene. You see it here as, as kind of like dike-like dike -like features in, in yellowish um, going up over this slope. I mean, this is like at least 200 meters high. And, um, and uh, the verlites in, in dark colors uh, are replaced by the uh, donite forming melts. Next slide, please. We see that, that uh, replacive donites, they are forming at all scales, both this um, 
uh, 10 to 100 meter scales that I showed you before and also now shown in the uppermost most image. We also have it on the decimeter scale to the lower left and also in the central picture in the bottom. And finally to the lower right we are seeing uh, this replacement of CPX by olivine forming melts um, even in the microscope or the microscopic scale as you of course would expect anyway. The next please. <coughs> Uh, yeah, we can just skip that one. That was actually supposed to be. It's just showing it's showing it the same. Next, next, please. So uh, the donites, they, um, if, if when when we're doing a microprobe analysis analysis of uh, the olivines and the, and and the reconstructing the cryptic stratigraphy, we can see that uh, the donites they actually go through very limited fractionation. We have less than fifty percent fractionation before we having a, a recharge event. And then we're seeing these multiple reversals. It's actually kind of difficult to identify them because they are happening all the time. So that the composition of the donites stays pretty much constant throughout hundreds of meters. Um, and we can also see in these donites that uh, the clinopyroxenes, when they are present, they are interstitial. You see that in the in the image to the, in, in the central image where we have polycolytic clinopyroxene um, enclosing. Uh, um, Primer crystals of, uh, of olivine. Uh, next, please. Um, late in the formation of both the donites and verlites, we have evidence of uh, residual melt migration. So, one of the last events that is happening during formation of the ultimate complexes is that the interstitial melts occasionally are mobilized along small faults. Um, like you can see particularly well in the, the image to the lower left, you can see this fault, this syn magmatic fault that has um, created a pathway for peroxonite forming melts. You have these uh, black peroxonites forming. Next, please. And finally, I mean, the very last, last terminal event for the formation of the Reinfjord complex and also the other complexes in the ultramafic complexes in. In silent is the is massive intrusion of a, a dike swarm. This is in silent. It is happening in the central part. The area is only like one time one kilometers. So we get the impression of this actually being um, uh, a limited conduit. I mean, these dikes here it looks like they, that they will continue for kilometers, but they are all focused to this one square kilometers in the center of the intrusion. If we take a closer look uh, next. We can see that um, uh, here that uh, the donite uh, comprises the host, and we can see that the dikes that are in place comprises multiple compositions going from very primitive picritic compositions to much more evolved alkaline and gabbroic compositions. If you look at uh, the dike that is right underneath um, uh, uh, the cap for uh, uh, the camera cap, the Sony cap, you can see that um, for some of these dikes, the, the, the boundary or the contact between the donut and the dike is almost a bit of hazy. Uh, you see that quite clearly. You also see to the, uh, to, to the far right, there's like almost like a, um, what should we call it, a ghost dike running through the image. Um, and these are very early. They're formed when, uh, when the, the cumulates were still mushy and unconsolidated. And then from here it goes on through the formation of various dike types, um, where you can see the context much more clearly. One of the latest dikes will be the one in the lower part of the picture. It is uh, white and have black patches, and that is a gabbro pegmatite. This is one of the last things that happens, except for the formation of some, al uh, some, uh, some alkaline dikes. So a very complex composition during the termination of the formation of the Reinfjord complex. Next. <coughs> That's, that finally brings us to uh, the roof of the magma chamber. All the ultramafic complexes in silent, they are in a right way of position. That means when we are in the lower part of the, of the topography, we are inside the magma chambers and we are in the most primitive parts. When we are uh, at heights of um, uh, 900 to, well, say more than 900 meters, we actually will uh, encounter the roof of the magma chambers. So we have the roof beautifully exposed, actually, in most of the large ultramafic complexes. So this is what it looks like. I mean, the roof, of course, is in gray, 
to the right, and then we have the ultramafic accumulate to the left in the yellowish brown colors. Next, please. Um, finally, I should mention very shortly that uh, the Reinfjord complex is characterized by numerous uh, copper nickel PTE deposits. Uh, this is what they may look like. This is one of the drill cores that uh, that uh, that uh, that we made as part of um, the project in the 2012-2014. It is drill core number four. And what you can see here is that uh, over a section of uh, 350 meters or so, we are having um, we are having one major PTE reef. If you look to the far right, uh, we are having at least three copper reefs. Some of them are shown with these red lines. For some reason, I lost uh, the labeling. But anyway, you can see them there in the upper part. We even have a nickel reef. But what you should notice here is that the PTE reef is decoupled from the copper reefs. Um, as a matter of fact, also in this case, the nickel reef is decoupled from both the copper and the PTE reefs. Peak values over one meter will be 1650 PBB PTE plus gold. That includes 235 PBB osmium and rhodium. This is really high values. Next, please. The PDEs uh, have been uh, carefully mapped by, uh, by Evan Nikolaisen. And uh, he made uh, images like the one that you can see right here. We have uh, the PGMs shown with the various labeling in uh, orange and blue frames to the right. And uh, then we have a color-coded um, image to the left. This is a scan of a whole uh, thin section, actually. And here, of course, you can see that the PGEs, they always occur in the donites. So they are associated with the formation of the genetic cumulates. What you should also notice here is that um, in the genetic cumulates, both at the PGE horizon, but also elsewhere, we have a high abundance of hydrous minerals. We have amphibole, shown in blue. You see most of them in the lower part of the image. And we have uh, various types of carbonates, shown in red. And you can see these carbonates being all over the place. And uh, both the amphiboles and the carbonates, they are primary. And they're formed when alkaline melts infiltrated the geonidic marshes. Next, please. Um, and uh, most of the PGMs, they, are, uh, they can either, either be classified as uh, monkeyite or Marinskyite. In other words, most of what we are finding is actually tellurites. So this is just what it may look like here in a pyrotite host, um, where the bright grain is, uh, is, uh, is either monkeyite mon or Marinskyite. Next. If we um, analyze the distribution of, or, uh, of, uh, of the entire um, platinum group elements shown here on the bottom axis from osmium to gold over iridium, rutetium, rhodium, platinum, and palladium, and then we normalize it to chondrite, we get a pattern like you're seeing right here. We're having this characteristic and quite rare trough shape um, where we have an osmium peak then we have an iridium uh, rutetium trough, then rhodium picks up a bit, and then we have uh, the highest peaks on platinum, palladium, and gold. Uh, next slide, please. If we compare that to a known analysis from throughout the world, we can see that this is a pattern that does not agree with the typical reef deposits shown in gray. It does not really uh, compare to the uh, chromatite hosted deposits shown in uh, sort of like purple colors in the bottom. The best, the best match that we're getting is actually when we compare it to typical chromatite deposits. In other words, chromatite flows, where we actually also see this osmium uh, peak. I mean, there we do actually also have an, 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 an iridium peak. And uh, again, we don't really see that in high fjord. Next slide, please. That finally brings us to this whole story about contamination and the importance of contamination for the formation of, uh, of uh, the automatic complexes. And uh, also, if we, if we adhere to the, to the Griffin theory, or perhaps the theory that uh, we prefer to explain these uh, automatic complexes. I mean, is it a donitic melt or is it the critic melt that forms the, the, the automatic complexes? We can do this in a very simplistic way by plotting MGO against uh, 
aluminium. This is like the most simple plot that we can form. These are all whole rock analysis. If we have such a diagram, we can plot in plagioclase to the upper left. Then we have clinopyroxene to the lower left. Then we have olivine to the lower right. And uh, we have the average contour of gabbro uh, from, from uh, Griffin plotting in uh, the black square. When we're doing this and we're looking at Einfjord, or I should say that I mean if we have if we have contamination, we should see that the melts are pulled towards the plagioclase apex uh, because they are contaminated with the gabbros that are plagioclase rich or the counterrecognizers that are also aluminium rich. As you can see that for Weinfjord, that is not the case. The only rocks that are pulled towards the plagioclase apex would be the hybrid gabbros in the contacts. However, if we do look at Melkman and the north of Rumensjord, we can see that we have much stronger degrees of contamination. And we are partially seeing the same for Kvalfjord. So we may say, oh well, okay, so maybe Griffin is right. Maybe we do have wholesale contamination with our geometric melts. But I'll show you later that uh, the reason why we are seeing this for the three other automated complexes is actually a sampling bias. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is another diagram essentially showing the same, but only for the Einfjord complex. We can plot uh, chromium against calcium, again in this whole rock. There in red we are seeing the geonetic cumulates, and uh, in uh, blue the geonetic and the verdetic cumulates. In blue we are seeing the olivine clinoperoxinides, um, and finally with the open squares we are seeing the hybrid gabbros. And what you can see is that um, that uh, that for for um, uh, uh, the olivine clinoperoxinides, we are having a mixing line going towards clinopyroxene in the in the in the verlites here called the upper layer series. Various for the open squares, the hybrid zones, we are surely going through the gabbros. But altogether, we are not really seeing much evidence for wholesale contamination, and therefore for Einfjord, we rule out that contamination is the way that we could explain these rocks. Next, please. Um, another way to show this is to plot uh, the clinopyroxene compositions here with the uh, total aluminium against uh, either ti uh, against titanium to the left and silica to against uh, aluminium to the right. I think I'll just explain the right figure. What you see here is that um, uh, the Einfjord complex and uh, to some extent, uh, well actually mostly the Einfjord complex is um, is uh, plotting in the null alkaline uh, region in terms of CPX compositions. Various uh, the other automated complexes actually overlap between the non-alkaline and the alkaline fields. And again, we can see that uh, this is probably uh, caused partially by contamination with these uh, well, actually alkaline tholytic uh, contour gabbros. Next, please. Um, that actually also encouraged us to try to, to calculate the parental melt composition, uh, partially based on the laser ablation IP, uh, ICPMS analysis of clinopyroxene that was done at uh, NGU. Uh, but we only did this for Reinfjord because we wanted to know something of the something about the parental melts from the least contaminated gabbros. What you could see here is that the olivine clinoperoxinides uh, shown in uh, shown in red. They are most enriched in the rare earth elements, uh, here shown as uh, uh, ytterbium and uh, lanthanum as examples. Um, in other words, they are most evolved. Um, then we have the donites and the verlites that have comparable uh, rare earth element abundances, and they are mostly plotting to the lower left with the low values of uh, these rare earth elements. We can see that the parents melts, they have an uh, ocean island basalt like distribution, uh, like in spidergrams. Um, and as a matter of fact, when we are modeling these melts from the composition of CPX, uh, we can see that um, that, uh, that uh, the CPXs in Rheinfjord produces melts that are very similar to the most primitive picrites in Rheinfjord. The most pr primitive picrites, they will have 16 to 22 weight percent MGO. They have a lot of chromium, 1594 ppm, and actually also a lot of nickel, 611. And all of them having similar trace element distribution patterns comparable to ocean island basalts. 
Um, next, please. If we do some more modeling, uh, this is all done by Thomas. Uh, we can see that if we take these primitive pecritic melts from the gabbros or from the from from the pecritic dikes, um, and here shown as composition melt one in solid black, and uh, then we compare this composition to the composition of our uh, CPX melts, I mean models from CPX compositions, they actually agree quite well with each other in terms of the trace elements that you see on the lower axis going from lanthanum to lutetium. So we have this typical enriched ocean island basalt pattern. When we try to fractionate these melts, we can actually form all the layered gap rows throughout silent by 30 to 50 percent fractional uh, crystallization. Next, please. That brings us to the conclusive slides, finally. Sorry for going a bit over time here. But um, in, our, in, our, in our story, what we are seeing is that um, first we are forming the layered gap rows. I mean, imagine that we have a deep-seated um, uh, mantle reservoir or some kind of continuous uh, supply of, um, of, uh, of uh, 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 tholidic melts from, from deeper down. We have to fractionate this mantle reservoir by between uh, 30 and 50 percent to form the layered gap rows that we are observing. But we can actually do this by having a starting point from these primitive pecritic compositions. Um, then later on, we are, we are in placing the ultramafic melts. You see that as I call it pecritic chromatidic. I mean, forget about the chromatidic. We can't really use that term. They are pecritic in composition, uh, really, but they could have formed chromatides higher up. That's probably what I mean. The temperature is uh, very high. And uh, therefore, in the beginning, we are having massive assimilation from the layered gap rows, and we have addition of CPX and OPX from the host gap rows, but not so much plagioclase. So we start by assimilation and contamination. During this process, if you look to the, in, 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 to the lower right, we are having formation of the olivine clinoperoxenides. And um, formation of these olivine clinoperoxenides is very important because they are lining the conduit system, and they are pro pro protecting the melts that come later on against contamination, and we are also um, generating a thermochemical insulation simply because we are heating up the entire region. Next, please. Then comes the point when we have magma chamber growth, and we have deposition of verlitic cumulates from um, of course, these very primitive hot melts. <clears throat> the verlites, they are barely contaminated at all. We have continuous growth and continuous recharge uh, supplying new melts. Uh, so if we go to uh, uh, the lower right, we're having the stage where we're beginning to form genetic uh, accumulates. Mostly we are forming genetic accumulates, but as we see in the field, we have wholesale assimilation of the verlite accumulates. If you go to Rheinfjord, we barely have any verlites left. I mean, all of it has been, um, um, uh, or all the kind of hyroxene from the verlites has been absorbed by the ultramatic melts. At the same time, when we're forming the uh, genetic cumulates, we are having infiltration from other sources from down there in the stenosphere. We are having infiltration of volatile rich alkaline melts and pyroxenitic melts. So this is a very complicated system, and this is probably one of the more important points of this whole uh, talk, that I mean, down there in the lower part of the crust, we are not just having nice, even, pecritic or titanium basalts, I mean, entering the systems, we are having a mixture of all kinds of melts coming in. Also, we can see that it is when we are forming the donites that we are also forming the PTE reefs. So the donite forming melts, they are very fertile. Next slide. Ah, there we are. Um, that brings us back to uh, the other ultramatic complexes that apparently looks like that they are very strongly contaminated by the contrarot gabbros. And of course, you can say that, well, perhaps Griffin have a point. We will say that this is really quite difficult to reconcile with our observations. First of all, what we do see is that the reason why the other ultramatic complexes show more contaminated composition is simply a sampling bias. Because here, we only have the uppermost part of the complexes 
exposed. In other words, Milkman, Nordra Bowman's Fjord and, and, and Kvalfjord, they are mostly sampled in the olivine climate peroxinites and the hybrid grab rows because we don't have this lower level with dunites and verulites exposed. You can also put it in other words, here we are only seeing um, uh, the topographically higher parts of the complexes. When we go to Einfjord and go to the lower parts, we get much more uncontaminated samples. So this is really the only reason why we have a huge difference between these complexes. It is simply a sampling bias. And uh, we intend to prove this by going back to Siland and actually resampling these other automated complexes, focusing on the uh, geonitic blocks that are, that are abundant and verulitic blocks that are abundant in these complexes. Um, I think that brings us to the last slide, which is um, this paper that we just uh, published. It is now uh, accessible electronically. It, it will come out in 2018, but it can actually be freely downloaded until uh, February 1. It is an uh, invite synthesis paper uh, in, uh, in Lithos that we spent way too much time writing, but uh, now it's there, so there you will find plenty of uh, additional information. So just for the final slides, uh, final slide please, ah, there we are, okay, so thank you to all our sponsors, uh, mm -hmm. generous, all of them, um, and uh, I just would like you to see that uh, the Norwegian Research Council um, is not amongst them, that's also typical. So thank you for now, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and uh, I really apologize for the slight delay and uh, all the technical hiccups, but um, I hope that you actually are still out there. Yeah, we have a lot of people actually. Uh, thank you so much for this very interesting talk. It's uh, really a really nice synthesis of all knowledge about Ceylon in these provinces, and it's really nice to see it. So if anyone has some questions, please type them in the chat box now. Um, so I have one question. Okay. If you mind. Uh, so I can move the slide at least. So here in this um, slide, do you think that the pyroxenite melt and this volatile rich alkaline melt, they like uh, intrude or they move together in same time in the volcanic conduct or it's more uh, alternative? Well, they I mean from our observations, I mean what we're seeing is that we are having veins and clots of um, alkaline melts, and uh, we are having veins and these um, these uh, mixing events of the peroxidic uh, melts. So I mean, surely, I mean based on that petrographic evidence, I have no doubt that they came in at least while the geonitic uh, accumulates were still uh, very mushy and actually very permeable. You can say you had a high permeability. I cannot say see that say that they came in exactly at the same time uh, as uh, the donite forming melts, but I mean surely they, they must have been right behind or even at the same time. You have to imagine if you are mixing um, epicritic melts and uh, an alkaline melts and you don't have complete mixing, you will probably expect some invisibility there. And then the alkaline melts being much lighter would just race towards uh, the upper part of the conduit and continue towards the surface. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have one question from MDU. Did you try to model assimilation using the isotope? Uh, I did not, but um, uh, Christian Tyner did uh, a lot of modeling um, from uh, the Hasbik Gabro. Actually, the isotope, okay, right, I should say this. First of all, we don't have any radiogenic isotopes from the automated complexes. This is one of the huge shortcomings of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the study so far of Silent and something that we will address, uh, well, actually we'll address already now from the samples that we took last summer. So we only have radiogenic isotopes from, well, actually mostly the Hasvik Gabro. So these are results from a, from a, from a, from a Christian Tyner. And uh, in a sense, it does not have so much to do. So, I mean, again, so you, when, when you saw these contaminated um, hafnium and the uh, neodymium values, these were for, from the most contaminated parts of uh, the Hasvik Gabro, plus from uh, the paper by um, uh, Richard Roberts, um, or actually from his thesis. I mean, I don't think he published yet, because, but, but, but from his uh, thesis from uh, 2006. Um, 
so he, he actually also analyzed uh, radiogenic isotopes in many of the gap rows and, and, and he, he confirmed uh, uh, the range that was um, originally described by Christian. Okay. And uh, Thor Danson, he has a question about uh, are the PGA rift entirely confined in the dunite? How they're confined to the dunites? If it's only, if they are only in oh. the dunite or? Uh, you can say that, well, I mean, in Rheinfjord, we only see them associated with the dunites, but we have um, a Hornblendite intrusion, also also mafic, which is farther to the east, and there we actually have a very close association between the Hornblendite forming melts and and uh, and uh, PG deposits. I mean, here we have like, I mean, almost like, I mean, um, yeah, let's call them, um, um, or still call them, extractional dikes, like vertical dikes mm -hmm. filled with sulfides. And we're believing that these dikes formed very late during formation of the Hornblend dike. So, so we do have it elsewhere, but in Rheinfjord, we only have it together with the with the, the Donites. Okay, did you, just for myself, did you find uh, PGs in some other uh, complex, like uh, in uh, Melkvan or somewhere else? We, we, no, one, no one really looked after it. So, uh, so like, I mean, we, we, we really would like to go, first of all, to Kvalfjord, which is very nicely exposed and more easily accessible than, uh, definitely, like, compared to Rheinfjord. Okay. But it's more easily accessible and, and they are, they are you know, like, I mean, we, we, I mean, see, you don't really see the PGs unless you're looking for them. We only have 1% sulfite, so it's like very easily overlooked. Okay. I mean, it's barely rusty in these very fresh, pristine rocks. Okay. And uh, Thor asks also, when is the field trip? Ha! <laughs> um, let's see now. Um, that's a good question. Let's, uh, let's discuss that in greater details at, uh, well, Perhaps so a pint of beer whenever we meet, but I mean uh, it's, it's it's actually a really good idea because I I, I we, we have talked very much about making a field trip. So it it as soon as we have some funding, I mean I would be really happy to uh, to uh, to organize a field trip to Rheinfjord. Okay, it's expensive. I mean you you can go to Rheinfjord without having a helicopter. Yeah. We tried we tried it in many different ways. You must have a helicopter to lift you up to the plateau. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I agree. Okay, other question? Uh, you mm, no, it looks like everything is okay. So maybe uh, somebody have some. Sorry, Lena? Trump is saying something about there was a thesis a few years back suggesting significant termination in the UEM, UEM, uh, UEM, UEM <laughs> using sulfur isotopes. I can answer that actually, because I mean these are actually our studies. Uh, they're not published yet, but we did sulfur isotope studies of uh, of uh, the sulfides in uh, Rheinfjord, and uh, what we are seeing is actually that sulfur in the ultramafic complexes is not contaminated. And um, uh, one of the main uh, conclusions from this work is that um, that uh, the sulfur forming the PG deposits and the copper nickel deposits, they are not derived from assimilation from either the gap rows. We have, we have plenty of sulfide in the gap rows, but they have a different uh, signature. They are, they, are more, they are more positive. Neither are they derived from the gneisses. They ha also have much more positive uh, uh, signatures. Um, so we can say that the sulfur that we're finding in Rheinfjord must come from below somewhere. It's, it's, it's a typical mantle land use. So I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe I was the one who said this. After too many beers, but I mean they're, they're not contaminated. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I guess um, the session for now is over. So if you have more questions for Rune, I will guess everybody can send you an email. Absolutely. Yeah, welcome here. Okay. So I will um, send you a follow-up email with a link for the YouTube channel video, and also I, I will uh, put a link for your paper. Really nice paper, and uh, yeah. So the next webinar will be in two weeks on the second of February, and will be given by uh, Marina Koreskova from Saint Petersburg State University, and the subject will be mineralogy and petrology of ultrapotassic minette of the White Sea region with an emphasis on apatite, 
and the Lake of Diamonds. I also would like to remind you that the workshop that I'm organizing in Tromso between 11th and 13th of June on mineral resources in the Arctic, a uh, deadline for the abstract submission is 4th of February. So if you didn't got anything and you are interested to attend to this workshop, please send me an email. And finally, uh, I would like to thank Rune to give this really nice uh, and interesting talk. And on behalf, on behalf of Rune and myself, we would like to thank you for joining us and taking time to view this presentation. Yeah, have a great day, everybody. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.